Today is our last message in the Home Fires Burning series. It's been quite a series, hasn't it? And I want you to know your pastor has literally sweat some bullets in preparing this whole series, and you all have been so gracious to let me share from my heart on so many things regarding our homes, our marriages, uh, doctrinal understanding of, of uh, marriage and separation and divorce and uh, how that all impacts all of us, how we need to look at it, how we need to march forward in our lives, how we need to put the past behind us and, and realize that God gives us a new day and a new season to, to worship Him and to glorify Him. And uh, today I want to turn the spotlight of God's Word um, on maybe the most sensitive topic of the whole series. And uh, here, here we are on the last series, and I'm going to bring up probably one of the most sensitive ones. Uh, we want to turn uh, the spotlight of God's Word directly on, in the Home Fires Burning series, on money. Yep, that's about what I thought I'd get from that. <laughs> and, and the way we handle it. Uh, a message entitled, God's Word About Money. Lord, I need your help today, God. And I pray that nobody has any tomatoes to throw at me or um, wild looks or whatever, but uh, Lord, that we would glorify you in this message. I pray that people's hearts will be tuned into what your word says and that they would know my heart as their pastor, Lord. If we have guests here today, money is not something we talk about very often, probably should even more, really. But, uh, Lord, I pray that this message will do a good work in our lives because when we, uh, when we address this topic well, um, good things happen and uh, focus comes into our lives and a pers perspective that we don't always have when we don't understand your plan for resources. So I pray you'll anoint me to share this word today in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, would you say amen if you agree with me? Before we get into our Bible verses, if you have your outline, you might have picked one up when you came in, or if you have the app and you're filling the online apps out, uh, the online, uh, fill, filling out the blanks on the online app, um, I want to just consider several statements uh, before we really get into this message uh, important in discussing money, things that would be important in discussing money. The first thing is money is essential. How many of you would say money is pretty essential in the world we live in today? That we, how many need money? All right, most of you, oh, you're afraid to raise your hand, but come on, I'll raise both of mine. We need money, right? Everybody needs money. It's essential. We depend on money to provide homes and food and clothing and cars and other things that we say are the necessities of life. Not having money is difficult in our society. The second thing I want to uh, make a statement about is money is also overrated money's overrated we could get so caught up in trying to get more than more that we end up hurting ourselves because we maybe could stop depending on the Lord do you realize that if we're not careful we could depend on money more than we depend on the Lord and if we do that money is way overrated amen now now, if you're guilty of anything that I'm talking about today or, or not kind of directly in line with God's Word about it, if you just say amen and keep smiling at me, nobody will know. If you, if you shut down on me, it, it's, it's a sure dead giveaway. All right. So <laughs> uh, our provision is God's business. Did you know that our provision is really God's business? If you're a believer, if you're a child of God, our provision is really God's business. Let me give you a scripture in Matthew 6, 31 through 33. It says, so don't worry at all about having enough food and clothing. Why be like the heathen? For they take pride in all these things and are deeply concerned about them. But your heavenly Father already knows perfectly well that you need them and he will give them to you if you give him first place in your life and live as he wants you to live. Amen. Thirdly, money can be used for great good. It builds hospitals, feeds the hungry, clothes the naked, provides for the needs of the kingdom of God. The gospel message 
is free, but it takes money and resources to pipe it in. And so money can be used for great good. Fourth, money can be used for great evil, too. Money has financed the drug, the drug culture, pornography, prostitution, wars, and every other vile practice known to man. It's the grease that lubricates the axles of sin. 1 Timothy 6.10 says, For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Notice here that um, money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money that's the root of all kinds of evil. And some people craving money have wandered from the true faith and pierced themselves with many sorrows. Five, money must be used properly. Every Christian has the responsibility to use the resources given to them by God to further God's work here on the earth. If you're a believer here today, the, reason we ha the primary reason we have resources is for the purposes of God's work on the earth. And I think we need to hear that because sometimes we don't realize the primary purpose as a believer for what money really is. When we invest money into God's kingdom, we also place our hearts there. If you want your heart more fully engaged in the things of God, put money there. Because the Bible says that wherever, wherever your money is, there your heart will be also. When we place money in the hands of the world, then we likewise tie our affections to the things of the world. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 19 through 21, don't store up treasures here on earth where they can erode away or may be stolen. Store them in heaven where they will never lose their values and are safe from thieves. If your prophets are in heaven, your heart will be there too. Now that doesn't mean that we're not to save. We, we do need to save. There's a scripture in the Bible that says a wise man or woman leaves an inheritance to their children's children. So, so we understand that, that it is good to be givers and savers, and it's good to live uh, well-managed in the resources God has blessed us. But we need balance in these things, and we need to realize, do you all understand that none of the money or things that you have in this life are going with you to heaven? None of it. Everything we work so hard for. You know, it's amazing to me about church when people don't want to talk about money in church because a lot of times it's all they talk about outside of church. It's a lot of what they think about outside of church. But we don't want to hear about money in church. Oh, you're not that way. You all got it all together. I know I could just say that because there's other churches out there that are all messed up, but we got it together around here. So... Um, Six, money can lead to terrible bondage. When we allow ourselves to fall into the slavery of debt, we're hindering our ability to follow the Lord properly. It's very difficult to keep the home fires burning in our homes, our families, our marriage with our children when money is not being handled God's way. Indebtedness can prevent us from serving the Lord properly. I know people who would love to give, who would love to serve as God has intended them to live, but their debt has literally enslaved them. Proverbs 22, and my heart breaks for that. I've spent much of my life in pastoral ministry in counseling and helping people get out of debt, and I thank God that God has allowed Kathy and I with people who would be so vulnerable to share us some of their life, some of their struggles. There, there, do you realize there are a lot of wonderful, godly, good people who don't have a good handle on money, who don't understand how to manage God's resources. And, and uh, they're hurting, they're struggling. And thankfully, Kathy and I over the years have been able to help so many people not because we're all that, but it is one of the strengths that in our lives is to help people uh, get on a plan and serve the Lord with their resources. Proverbs 22, 7 says, Just as the rich rule the poor, so the borrower is servant to the lender. And number seven, the seventh statement is money must be used to bring glory to God. 
Let me read to you Malachi 3, verses 8 through 11. It says, should people cheat God? How many know the obvious answer to that would be no? Should people cheat God? Well, the obvious answer would be no. Yet you have cheated me. But you ask, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you, God? You have cheated me of the tithes and offerings due to me. You are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be enough food in my temple. If you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies, if you do, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. Wow, the Lord says, put me to the test. God says, test me in this. If I will not bless you, if I will not take care of you, when you do what I ask you to do, your crops will be abundant, for I will guard them from insects and disease. Your grapes will not fall from the vine before they are ripe, says the Lord of heaven's armies. When we use our resources to obey and exalt God, then we give him a wonderful opportunity of proving his power and proving his authority in our lives. When God is denied this opportunity, then we have entered into a state of unrepented sin before the Lord. Now, I know that's a hard statement, but, but I had to put that statement in this message because it's the truth. And I've got to love you guys enough. You see, I'm saying that once in a while now when I'm up here preaching. I have to love you enough to share the truth, hopefully with tact, with love, with the right heart. But, you know, I think love is so distorted in our world today. Well, if you love me, you wouldn't say anything difficult. You wouldn't say anything I didn't want to hear. It'd be all lovey-dovey. And I, I, think, I think we have distorted love so bad. We have to love each other enough to be honest with each other, hopefully with good motives, with the right heart, because that matters too. We have to let God open the door. We have, you know, some, if you're like me, sometimes if you're not being ordered of the Lord properly, and you're not in prayer, sometimes you can speak the truth, but the timing was terrible. How many know we need the right time? And so... This is the right time to talk about this. We're going to discuss the primary use of money this morning. For a child of God, I'm going to, I'm going to, in case you don't know, what is the primary use of money for a child of God? And I'm going to tell you what it is. Giving is the primary use for money to a child of God. It's not paying our bills. It's not doing things for ourselves, which is all good. Kathy and I enjoy spending on each other. She spends on me out of our money. and I spend on her out of our money. Sometimes, because if you knew the way I am, I get concerned when she buys me too many nice things because I know where that money came from. told me the other day, he says, why is it okay for you to do it for me, but you don't like me doing it for you? And I said, because I lose control when you do it for me. <laughs> Does anybody here besides me have control issues sometimes? You better raise your hand if you do. Don't leave me alone here. But the primary use of money to a believer is giving. When we give, we honor God, we advance his kingdom, we demonstrate faith in his promises, we expose ourselves to his blessings, and we do something in which everyone can participate. And with those thoughts in mind, we'll join Jesus and his disciples in the temple as Jesus is watching people bring their offerings. And in this text, Jesus gives us some principles that should govern the use of money, especially in our giving. And our text is Mark 12 this morning. Starting at verse 41, Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. How dare him! Do you get that picture? 
Can you imagine if Pastor Rod and I and Pastor Milton and Jordan all came up here as the pastors of this house and got the collection boxes and we watched what every person gave in to the bucket? And we gave nods of, of approval or disapproval. Can you imagine how terrible that would feel? First of all, Pastor Rod, I wouldn't want to do that. And I would imagine you wouldn't want me to. I, when I read scripture, sometimes I just have to put myself in that situation to help me discern what, what did that look like. Jesus sat down near the collection box in the temple and watched as the crowds dropped in their money. Many rich, pe rich people put in large amounts. Then a poor widow came and dropped in two small coins. Jesus called his disciples to him and said, I tell you the truth, this poor widow has given more than all the others who are making contributions. For they gave a tiny part of their surplus, but she, poor as she is, has given everything she had to live on. So in your outline, I want to first talk about the matter of our giving. And first thing we're going to point out in the matter of our giving from verse 41, the first thing we're going to point out is that Jesus cares about our giving. And I think we need to start there. Jesus cares about our giving. This is evident from the fact that Jesus was observing the people casting their money into the treasury. He was watching them give. You know, how, how many of you believe that Jesus is here today? Do you believe Jesus is here today? Do, do, we, believe, do we believe that he watches what we give? What could Jesus say about our giving? The second thing I want to talk about is God's challenge in our giving. The yardstick, by the way, has always began at what is called the tithe. Have you ever heard that term, the tithe? This is a word that simply means the first 10% of our increase. That's important for you to note. Tithe is not 10%. Tithe is the first 10%. Very important distinction. It's the first. It's the first part. God desires that every person be actively involved in giving the tithe willingly back to him since, in case you didn't know this, it already belongs to him. The Bible says it already belongs to him. So we're, get, we're not giving God our tithe. We're giving God his tithe. We're giving back to God what already belongs to him because we are the steward and he's the owner of everything. If you're a child of God today and you're a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, everything you have belongs to God. That's a wonderful place to get in your theology, to know that everything I have is already the Lord's. And when I bring the tithe to the storehouse, to the church house, I'm giving back to God what is already his. And when we're faithful in the tithe, did you know this? And I don't have time to go into a whole big, I, I could take a lot of time with this, kind of digging this out more for you, but I'll just tell you this. When we give God his tithe, the 10%, we think we're releasing 10%. God doesn't receive it as 10%. When you study this back in the, in the word of God, when you give God the first fruits, the first part of your increase, Whatever you've made this week, when you give God the first part and the tithe, you, you're releasing 10% that's already God's back to him, and God doesn't receive it as 10%. God receives it as though you gave him everything. And I want to tell you, you won't outgive God. You won't outgive him. There are three basic reasons why people do not tithe that I want to mention this morning. Three basic reasons why people do not tithe. Number one, some have never been taught to tithe. There are people here this morning, sadly enough, that I realized as I was preparing this week on this message that maybe you haven't been here very long or I haven't talked about this in such a long time that there are people that haven't been taught about this. Maybe their mothers and fathers did not tithe. 
Maybe their pastors have been silent about the matter of tithing because they're afraid people will leave. Do you know pastors like me sometimes are afraid to talk about tithing because they're afraid people might leave? I probably need to just tell you this morning that I'm sorry that I've been a little bit shy in talking about money. Mostly because I think you'll think that I'm doing it to get you to give more to the church. And I've challenged and questioned and searched my heart, and that's really not the truth. Some of you simply do not understand tithing for believers in Christ and the favor and the joy that giving brings to our lives. The second thing is some misunderstand the place of tithing in the Lord's kingdom. There are those who feel that tithing is not for us today. It's not something we should do today. This comes from a lack of understanding about what tithing is and where the concept came from. And I'll clear that up in just a few moments in another point in this message. I want to come back to that. And thirdly, some simply refuse to obey the Lord. And I've got to throw that third one in there. Some simply, they know to tithe, they've been taught about it, they believe in it with their head, but it hadn't dropped into their heart. And some people, and this is where you keep smiling if you're guilty, simply refuse to obey the Lord. There are those who know the Bible tells them to do this, but they refuse to do it. They either fear that the Lord will not take care of them, or possibly the truth might be that money is just too important to them. If we know that it's the Lord's will and we don't do it, then sin enters the picture, the Bible says, and there's always a, pri a price to pay for unrepentant sin. Now I want to stop here for a moment and tell you that if that's where you are today, I'm going to ask the Lord to draw a line and I'm going to ask you today, sometime in your day, to repent for not being faithful in your giving and ask the Lord to forgive you. And I, I really felt this morning as I woke up real early this morning thinking about this message felt like the Lord put it on my heart, and you test this. I felt like the Lord said, if you will come to him with a truly repentive heart, maybe you need to talk to your spouse if you're married. Maybe you need to talk to your children. But I have sensed that if you're truly repentant, the Lord will help you to go forward in this. You won't have to go back, pay penance, pay triple on everything you failed to give, I really sensed in my heart, God's going to help you to go forward and trust him like you've never trusted him and literally find the joy, the great joy there is in giving God's way. It is really a joyful experience as we understand the Lord. I remember when my dad first started tithing, he'd never been taught tithing. And he heard about it and decided he was going to do it, and the Lord started convicting him. Did any of you remember when you didn't tithe and you first started and you were struggling with it? And the first time my dad tithed when I was a little boy, the usher came by with the baskets. And back then they had, uh, Rod, you know about this, you're in the same kind of church. They had handles with baskets. Remember those handles? And, the, and my dad was sitting on the end there. And the past, or, or the usher, the usher got, and Dad was on the back row because he didn't trust any of these crazy Pentecostal people. And he was on the back row, and the usher got all the way to the back row and went this to my dad, and my dad went, he had his tithe first time, and he went like this. And he looked at the usher like he was half mad at him. The next week, the usher comes by my dad, and the usher goes like this to my dad. <laughs> It was hilarious. I'm not sure Dad knew the joy of giving at first, but praise God, he got there. My dad and mom became great givers. I watched them, I watched them empty their wallets many times as the Lord would lead them, and I watched them give to hurting people. And one of the great joys of my life was to watch my dad and mom always helping somebody. If we know that it's the Lord's will and we don't do it, sin enters the picture. 
James 4, 17 says, remember it is sin to know what you ought to do and then not to do it, not do it. So we, we learn regarding the matter of our giving that Jesus cares about our giving, that God challenges us in our giving, and thirdly, God's claim to our resources. Too often we get hung up on the tithe and forget that everything we have is the Lord's, and all the money that God permits us to generate is to be used as he leads and directs. And so now I want to move to the second of the three points this morning. And the second point is the measure of our giving from verses 42 through 44. As Jesus stood there that day watching the people give, he was watching not only how they give, but he was watching how much they gave. And at the temple treasury in that time period, there were 13 brass chests or boxes into which the worshipers cast their offerings. These chests were called trumpets because they were shaped like trumpets. As the metal coins were cast into these brass trumpets, they made a loud noise. And the more coins that were cast in, the louder the sound. They didn't have bills like we have them today, or checks or credit cards. They had coins. And rich people gave a lot of coins, and they threw them in these brass trumpets, and they made a big noise. Each chest bore an inscription declaring what the money inside was to be used for, and those who wanted to put on a show could do so quite easily as they cast their money into these trumpets. And this was the practice that was rebuked by Jesus. We read this in Matthew 6, 2, when he said, When you give to someone in need, don't do as the hypocrites do, blowing trumpets in the synagogues and streets to call attention to their acts of charity. I tell you the truth, they have received all the reward they will ever get. Now imagine here, as Jesus is there that morning in the temple, and the little widow gave her two small coins, it sounded very small compared to the offerings of the rich. However, what I read in that text this morning is that to the Lord, those two coins sounded very big. This little widow woman gave all she had. And Jesus was sitting there watching as the rich people gave their money. And he never said anything. But when this little widow comes up and puts in her two mites, her two coins, Jesus could no longer remain silent. He now has to say something. He used her giving as an example to everybody. In fact, her testimony still stands today, 2,000 years later, as one of the greatest examples of sacrifice in all of recorded human history. And this little widow woman that we don't know her name, who gave these two little mites, has a place in the Word of God, and we're talking about her 2,000 years later. And with this in mind, notice principles from the Bible concerning the measure of our giving. First of all, we're to give proportionately. God's starting point for giving is the first 10% for everyone. The principle of giving is called the tithe. And the Bible says in Malachi 3.10 and Leviticus 27.30 that it's the Lord's. I know what I'm about to say might sound harsh this morning, but any other use of the tithe constitutes stealing from God. I know that sounds harsh. I know that could sound self-serving, but any other use of the tithe is stealing from the Lord. Tithing did not originate with the law, by the way. Somebody said, well, I don't think we're to tithe anymore. We're under grace. We're not under the law anymore. Yeah. I thought about that. And, and you know, the truth is, the heart of it is, we don't have to tithe. We get to tithe. But I, I want to put something to rest here. I'm no great theologian, but I did a lot of study on that because I've been hit with that one for a few, a few times. And I, I'm going to just say this to when I get off my notes right now, get nervous because I'm nervous. <laughs> Can I tell you that sometimes when people bring up this law and grace thing, 
they got to watch their motives. Because if you're now under grace and don't have to tie, then that gives you an excuse to do less and not more. You miss the heart of God. Because Jesus came and didn't do away with the law, he fulfilled it. And then he took it to a whole new level. He said to us guys, he said, in the law, if you committed adultery, if you committed fornication with a woman, you sinned against God. In grace, he says, if you meditate and ponder and think about it in your mind and rehearse it through in your mind with a woman, you've done the same as committing adultery. So when the thoughts come, we have to resist them. We have to send them away from us. Because when Jesus came, he tried to get past man's religion and get to the heart. It's a heart issue. And tithing did not originate with the law. 430 years before the law was given, Abraham offered the Lord a tithe of all his increase. Genesis 14, 20. Before the law. 430 years before there was ever the law. Even before that, Abel. Remember Abel? Adam's son. Abel brought the Lord the first fruits of his flocks. Genesis 4, 4. The idea of giving the Lord his part directly off the top is as old as humanity itself. Regardless of who we are, our starting point of giving is exactly the same for every one of us. We're all required to give the Lord his tithe. Anything less is cheating and stealing from God. And you know what I know? Most of you are not people who steal and cheat. But a lot of wonderful people who would not steal their neighbor's shovel, would not steal their, their next door neighbor's stuff just because it was available to them, they would not do that. But sometimes those same people, if we're not careful, we steal from God. Secondly, we're to give properly. There's a proper place that has been appointed by the Lord for us to give our tithes. Malachi 3.10 tells us we're to bring our tithes into the storehouse that's also called the Lord's house. God's plan is that all the tithe is to be brought here when we gather together as his church. Now, let me, let me answer a question by asking a question. Is it proper to give the tithe to a missionary, to the needy, to some ministry, and go around our local church body and I believe, according to the Word of God, the answer is no. The only proper use for the tithe is for it to be brought into the Lord's house to be distributed as the Lord directs under the constituted authority and accountability that he has placed into that local congregation. And we give as unto the Lord. Somebody said, well, I, I don't know if I want to give the tithe to my local church because I don't know if I agree with e the way they use every dollar. Let me talk about that for a minute. I bet you don't agree with every dollar you spend in your house. Is there anybody here that could do better with the dollars that are spent at your house? Uh -huh. I was asking the Lord about that one day. I, I got to tell you. I know how most all the funds are spent around here, and I'm very thankful that God has helped us to be good stewards of this house and to do outreach and ministry and missions around the world. And that God has blessed us to be able to live debt-free at this point in our journey. But one day I realized it's not even really about that. We give as unto the Lord. I learned a long time ago, when I give the Lord his tithe, you notice how I'm trying to get that in your mind? Get, get your ownership off of it. We're giving God what's already his. Get, get your wording right on that. We're giving God his tithe. And I, I learned, God, if you have me here at Calvary, this is my home. Now, I'm not talking as a pastor. I'm talking about as a member because I'm a member too. This is my church. This is where God is planted me and set me 
I give here as unto the Lord because God this is what you said to do and I'm praying and trusting that the elders and the pastors and the board of directors and the people who make decisions around here with me as the pastor they're not perfect people but they're making good solid prayerful decisions and if they miss it once in a while I gave us unto the Lord I gave us unto the Lord I'm gonna go ahead on a limb here I got just a few moments left I heard a family many years ago say, Pastor, I'm not tithing right now because I'm taking the tithe and helping my children. My kids are struggling so bad, I'm helping them with the tithe. And as sure as I'm standing up here before you, the Lord spoke to me about that and said, encourage them and tell them they are not helping their children by giving their children what belongs to God. The Bible says we're to give tithes and offerings. I'm thankful that many of you give above the tithe around here because you believe in the missions and the outreach and the ministries we're doing here at home and around the world. And the, many of you have given to this building when we build it over and above the tithe to get it paid for. Many of you have sacrificed and given. But I, I want to tell you, if the Lord speaks to you to give something over and above your tithe to Calvary, great, or to, to another ministry, in another part of the world or to another outreach you you have the blessing of God to do that as the Lord directs you I want to be sure to say that you know I can't preach everything in one message about this topic it's impossible but the tithe belongs to the local church and any ministry that knowingly takes tithe from people they're not helping themselves in the long run God keeps the books Thirdly, we're to give perpetually. In other words, our giving is to be a regular part of our lives. Paul, who started the church at Corinth, said in 1 Corinthians 16, 2, on the first day of each week, you should each put aside a portion of the money you have earned. Don't wait until I get there and then try to collect it all at once. See, many give only when they have extra or when they're moved by conviction or guilt to give. But the proper method of giving is every time we receive pay, we give to the Lord and it's to be the first thing we do in other words it's to be what the Bible calls first fruits and, and I don't have time to get into this but the Lord spoke to Kathy and I a number of years ago and we we have taken that so that every time we receive increase or pay the first thing we do is give to God what belongs to him first fruits first thing before we pay our bills before we check and see if we can balance before see if we have enough to do everything we got to do we give God the first because the, here's what I know the devil will try to make sure you don't have enough to obey God and and I'll tell you how it got into my spirit would I rather owe God or owe mid-american and I'm not saying I don't want to pay my bills, because I do, but I would rather owe Mid-American than owe God. Because the Lord says when we make the first part holy, when we give God the first part, the Bible says it becomes holy. And when we give the first part, it becomes holy. Then Romans eleven six 6 says the rest becomes holy too. In other words, when we give God the first, everything we have becomes holy. Wow. There's so much there to preach, and I don't have time. Let me get to the last point, the motive of our giving. Can you imagine the reaction of the crowds as the rich men threw in their large sums of money, maybe some majoring ooing and awing there that day at the temple where Jesus was as the trumpets sounded and the money fell into the collection boxes can you see that little widow woman maybe kind of hunched over walking slowly maybe elderly struggling to drop in her two coins she drops in her offering only two mites equal to about a half cent in our money the crowds were probably silent as she gave her offering, but while the others received the praises of men for their gifts, this woman now, do you understand? Listen to this. 
she receives the praises of God. You see, it isn't the dollar amount that makes the offering a blessing. It's the heart behind the gift. It comes down to motive. And let's talk quickly about the motive of our giving. First, we should give thankfully. This is what we ought to do, our giving in light of what the Lord has done for us. In other words, folks, when we give, I think one of the things we need to be thinking about when we give is thinking about what the Lord has done for us. How he gave his life. How he didn't withhold one thing for us to have eternal life, to be with the Lord forever and ever. Secondly, we should give cheerfully. According to the Bible in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, God loves a cheerful giver. The word literally, do you know what the word literally means, cheerful giver? The word literally means hilarious. We should give not because we feel obligated to give, but because it delights our hearts to be able to give unto the Lord. We, we should literally be hilarious about it. Woohoo! I get to give. That's, that's really the biblical definition. I get to give. Wow, I get to give today. I get to honor the Lord with first fruits. I get to put him first place in my life. And the whole thing of my life becomes holy. Hallelujah. Third, we should give liberally. This simply means that we're not to be stingy when it comes to giving to the Lord's work or his people. In truth, we can expect God to bless us in direct proportion to the level of our giving, according to Luke 6, 38. And it's never about what, how much we give, it's about what's left over. So don't be a cheapskate when it comes to giving. There will be some who will say that they can't afford to give, but you know what, that's not true. It's not true. It's a lie from the enemy. We can't afford not to give. The Lord teaches us to take the Lord at his word and put him to the test, Malachi 3.10. You know, I've known pastors who've got up in the pulpit and said to new people, I want you to start tithing for three months and see what the Lord does. And, and if, you're in, if you're not in better shape than you were, I'm going to give you all your money back. So I'm not going to tell you that today. <laughs> Pastor Rod's rich. He'll give you all your money back, all right? I'll let him do that. <laughs> fourth we should give sacrificially in our text Jesus was impressed not by the amount of the widow's gift but by the fact that she gave out of her need the rich gave out of, the sur out of their surplus she gave all she had and it got the Lord's attention if we want to start giving when we have plenty we'll face two problems we'll never get to where we think we have plenty <laughs> And secondly, when we do have extra, it'll seem like too much to give. And when we realize that he owns it all, tithing won't be so difficult after all. Now, if you're here this morning and you're not faithful in giving, I want you to know there's a cure. It's called repentance and obedience to the Lord. The Bible says that anyone who refuses to give the Lord what belongs to him loves their money more than they love God. Giving the tithe is not the cure. And this is my last statement. We're going to pray together today. But giving the tithe is not the cure-all if you have struggles with money. But if you're faithful in giving to God, if you're also faithful in putting a little something away and having a savings, and if you'll stay clear of bad debt, stay clear of bad debt. And if you have bad debt, get some help and get out of it and don't ever go back. And, and I'm going to tell you a fourth thing. Give to God what's his. Have a savings. Stay clear of bad debt. Here, here's another one. Don't try to keep up with other folks. Hello, somebody. Don't try to keep up with somebody else. It's amazing how many people love to try to keep up with somebody they don't even like. <laughs> Maintain a budget. A lot of people treat their money with their head stuck in the sand. They, don't, they just do what they're going to do and hope it works out. That's poor planning. 
But if you'll give God what's his, and if you'll have a savings and stay clear of bad debt, and don't try to keep up with others, the Lord's blessings will abound in your life, and money and things will not be your God. Lord, I thank you today. I thank you for givers. Wow, Calvary is blessed with givers. But Lord, I also realize that as we talk about the home fires burning, that money is a huge issue. And there's so many things we could talk about money. As I've narrowed it down a little bit today and talked about the most important part of money, and that's giving. I pray that it'll be received with all the heart and intent. And uh, Lord, those that um, haven't known about this or understood it clearly or have just simply not been obedient, I pray that they'll have some time with you today to pray about it, repent if they need to, and turn over a new chapter in their life of obedience and favor and the holiness of God and all that they and all that you've entrusted us with to manage your resources. I thank you for the people of God today that I get to pastor and love and encourage in even difficult topics. I bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're our guest here today, we hope you'll stop at the Connection Center and pick up a gift. We love, we love all of you. God bless you. You are dismissed.